Okay, so this is lecture seven. Uh, it's about the system type and something called steady state error. Uh, we're just coming off of lecture six where we formally introduced the idea of feedback control. Okay, and in that lecture we outlined um, some of the fundamental control objectives that we're trying to satisfy with our controller design. Um, of course, the most important control objective for, for all control systems is stability. Uh, you need to do everything in your power to guarantee closed loop stability because if you don't have closed loop stability you can't talk about any subsequent performance metrics right if your system is unstable that's bad news um, so uh, we, we did a lecture in lecture 5 regarding stability which really pertained to that first control objective um, we have one tool at our disposal at this point for designing a control system uh, that satisfies that stability control objective which is the root stability criterion um, we're going to develop more of those as as we progress through the course but for this lecture we're actually going to be talking about the second um, control objective which was the ability to track a given reference okay so uh, remember we're still talking about the unity feedback control structure here okay so the tracking objective is basically whatever reference you're asking the system to follow you just want to design a controller so that your output follows that input okay so in the case of I don't know in the case of a step input a step input you're asking the system to follow this and your output y might not you know it might not go exactly to that value instantaneously but it might do something like this uh, which is good, you know, you know. Ultimately, you want the output to follow the input as closely as possible. Um, and what we're going to define today is something called the steady state error. Okay, so for uh, a simple example like this, the error. Remember that the error here is always the difference between r and y. So it's r minus y. It's basically the difference between what you want and what you actually have. So if you have a scenario like this here, where you're trying to track a step reference, and your output, which is this yellow line, kind of you know oscillates a little bit, but then eventually tracks right along that reference value, that's great, because what that implies is that your steady state error, uh, sometimes referred to as e of infinity, right? So e at time uh, approaches infinity is equal to zero. Okay, so you've got perfect tracking if the steady state error is zero and ultimately that's the goal you want to be able to track any reference ideally um, with zero steady state error that would satisfy your tracking control objective the thing is okay the thing is not all systems are capable of tracking all different types of references okay and so that's what this lecture is about it's about uh, determining well, well, first of all, it's about classifying what type of system can track what type of reference, okay? So by the end of the lecture, you should be able to hopefully um, intelligently design a controller so that it can track, so that the closed loop system can track some given uh, desired reference input. That's the goal for today, um, uh, is to at least build the framework so that you can make those um, design decisions okay and the place we're going to start with is something is a definition is something called the system type okay and I'm not talking about you know what type of dinner did you eat last night I'm talking about uh, the type uh, I, I put it in all caps here as sort of a keyword the type of a system is a numerical classification of that system so you can be type 0 type 1 type 2 and so forth and what that means is that it it somehow describes the ability of that system to track a given reference. Okay. Um, now keep in mind the definition of a system type that I'm outlining here. This is actually not specific to the the tracking control objective yet. This is actually a more generalized description about what the system type is. Okay. It's a bit confusing, so I want to walk you through it here. Um, it starts here, basically. So you always start with this phrase: a system is. And then you kind of have to take your pick. Uh, you go down this list of options here uh, to see what type of reference you're trying to track. Okay. Um, okay. So, so for example, a system is, and then you would go to this line. A system is type zero, 
if a step input to that system, i.e. if an input of the form r of t is equal to a constant, if that results, okay, so then you go down to the bottom here, if that results in an output that converges to a non-zero constant, then that system is type zero. Okay, so the full statement would read, a system is type zero if a step input results in an output converging to a non-zero constant. Or, if that's not the case, a system could be type one if a ramp input results in an output converging to a non-zero constant. Or a system is type two if a parabolic input, something that looks like this, results in an output converging to a non-zero constant. Okay, so I understand that that's pretty vague and probably hard to wrap your head around. So best thing to do is to probably look at a couple of um, scenarios. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll sketch out a couple of scenarios and what you're gonna find is that based on any input-output relationship, it may not be possible to identify the system type. In other words, you have to apply the right input uh, you have to apply an input such that the output converges to a non-zero constant before you can identify the type of that system uh, based on sort of some input-output data. Okay, so let's do the following. Okay, so what I've sketched out here are a few possibilities, okay, and so uh, I've sketched out basically a few reference, these are all in yellow, so there's a yellow step reference, a yellow ramp reference here, which is just a straight linear reference, and then this parabolic reference that has the form of um, t squared, and then in the green, um, the y, which is the output, that's the measured output, um, and now what I want to highlight here is this definition of the system type uh, pertains to this this term called the output. Now the output of a system is not necessarily y, right? The output of a system, generally speaking, is the numerator uh, is the numerator of the transfer function. Remember the transfer function is that from the input which is in the denominator to the output which is in the numerator. So this uh, definition of system type can apply to many different types of systems and in our case for this very first example I'm setting you up with uh, what I want you to do is focus on the transfer function we'll call it h of s that's the transfer function from r to E, because remember, eventually down the line, we're going to be talking about the tracking control objective, which is relevant to this transfer function from R to E. Right? We want to see that the error can be zero or as close to zero as possible, given any input reference we're trying to track. Okay, so for this setup, this example, this is the uh, transfer function of interest. Now, if we look at the first, okay, if we look at the first example, we have an input reference uh, which is a step input okay so this remember this is our input the error itself which is the numerator of this transfer function is our output of the system so keep that in mind this um, reference this is a step so it's a horizontal line that's our our reference our step reference and then the output of the of the of the closed loop system which is the green line that's y Right, so the, the measured output of the control system is y, and notice that y converges on r. Okay, so this is actually a scenario where the output tracks the reference perfectly, which is good. Uh, ultimately, that's a good thing. However, what we're trying to do is to identify the system type based on this input-output data. It's going to seem strange, but even though the output y, the measured output y, converges, it does converge to a non-zero constant, whatever this value is, the system type cannot be determined from this input-output data. And that's because the output of the system we're considering here is the error. And if you have a scenario where the output of, the measured output of the control system tracks the reference perfectly, then the error itself converges to zero. And zero is not a non-zero constant. 
In other words, the input-output data that we're given here for this step reference does not subscribe to any one of these scenarios in the definition. So the system type can't be um, uh, ascertained just by looking at the input-output data here. Okay. On the other extreme, we're still considering the input to be the reference, the output to be the error. If we look at the parabolic input, so we're trying to track this dotted yellow line with our control system, but based on our control design, we just we really just can't get there. Okay, so our, our measurement y kind of starts to curve up, but it never follows, and it is never able to track that parabolic reference. So in this case, as time goes on, the error itself, which is again the difference between r and y, that gap actually gets wider and wider. So the error itself diverges to infinity. And infinity is not a non-zero constant. So based on this input-output data, we also cannot determine the system type. However, for this Goldilocks case in the middle here, we're trying to track a ramp reference, which is this uh, linear, linearly sloped line. right? So r of t is equal to t to the first power. And then this sort of squiggly green line is what the measurement is doing. So this is actually the measured output. So it initially starts at zero, but then you know, maybe there's some inertia in the system. It takes a little bit of time to get going. Maybe there's some oscillation in the system, and that oscillation eventually decays. And we reach a state where it's sort of tracking parallel to that ramp reference. Now this is a scenario where the output, remember, the output of the transfer function here is the error itself. The output error is actually converging to a constant value. Because the measurement y is parallel to the reference, the difference between r and y remains constant. So in this scenario, our output, which is the error, converges to a non-zero constant. And so in this case, the, the way to apply this definition is a system is, and because we're dealing with a ramp reference, you want to refer to this row here. A system is type 1 if a ramp input, so r of t is equal to t, results in an output, in this case the error, the output converging to a non-zero constant. So in this case, we can determine based on the input-output data, that whatever system resulted in this input-output relationship is a type 1 system. Okay, So hopefully that cleared up some of the confusion rather than adding to it, but this is one way to sort of visualize um, the system type of a system, uh, the system type of a particular plant. And it all comes down to, well, remember what the input and output for that transfer function is. The input is always the denominator, the output is always the numerator. Okay, So again, try not to be confused when I say output of a transfer function could be anything. It's, it's always the numerator of the transfer function. Don't get that confused with the output of the closed loop system, which is y. Right? The measurement, the measured output is always considered to be y, but the output of a given transfer function is always just whatever's in the numerator. Okay, and, the, and that's what this definition applies to, is the, is the um, this definition of system type applies to the input-output relationship of any arbitrary transfer function like this one given here, right? Okay, so hopefully we have um, sort of this basic understanding of this sort of new concept that I've given you, which is called system type. Uh, and by the way, I've reworked this lecture a number of times in the past, and, and the version that I have now is, I think, the best that I've done so far in terms of keeping everything as concise as possible, because there are many different ways to approach this topic, um, and the way that this lecture goes is, it's less of a linear path explaining things from point A to point B, it's more of, I'm going to present you a bunch of seemingly random pieces of information and facts, which we will stitch together at the end of the lecture. Okay, So hopefully, um, given this little disclaimer, you'll be able to follow along with this lecture, as it's not like a typical lecture where 
it's more of like a narrative and I sort of try and take you along this linear path. Okay, so this lecture is going to seem a bit uh, jumbled, but it's the, I don't know, it's kind of just the way that this material works out, okay? Okay, so so let's let's do a little bit of a, a, a check of our understanding. Make sure we really understand the concept of system type. Okay, um, g of s. Okay, so now we're going to look at a different transfer function. This is a transfer function from r to y. Okay, the closed loop transfer function. Let's suppose that this has a form two over s plus two. A step input. If we apply a step input. That would imply that little r of t is equal to 1, or t to the 0. Okay, A step input, uh, we know how to compute the output uh, as a result of applying a step input. Okay, So this is just coming back to a forced response type of uh, computation. The idea being y of s is equal to g of s times r of s, if we just rearrange this transfer function definition. Uh, I know g of s, that's 2 over s plus 2. I can get big R of s if I take the Laplace transform of little r of t. So big R of s is going to be 1 over s. Okay. So what I need to do is to take the inverse Laplace of 2 over s plus 2 times 1 over s, which I know how to do. This is just a review, right? So this is way back from lecture 2. So my actual step response works out to be 1 minus e to the minus 2t. Okay. So Again, we've got a closed loop transfer function. I hit it with a step input. This is the actual output here. Okay. Now this looks like, uh, graphically speaking, this we know what this looks like, right? So I've got my I've got my step reference here, right? So this is r of t and y of t, which I just computed using the inverse Laplace method. Well, it it starts at zero, right? because e to the 0 is 1, so I've got 1 minus 1, but eventually this exponential component decays, so I'm subtracting an exponentially decaying component from a steady state value of 1. So this output is actually going to look like this. Okay, so this is my actual y of t. Okay, so from this we can actually determine the system type. Right? This would say that uh, a system is, okay, let's refer to our definition here, a system is type 0. A system is type 0 if a step input results in an output converging to a non-zero constant. Well, you have to remember what the output is for this problem. For this example, the output itself is the y of t variable. Okay? In the previous problem, we had a plot that kind of looked like this one, where we had a step input and the output y converged to that value. But the output in that problem was the error, so we were not able to determine the system type. In this case, however, the output is the measurement y of t, and we can see that graphically y of t does converge to a non-zero constant. Right? I mean, we can see it right here. That non-zero constant happens to be equal to 1. So because of that, we can actually determine this system to be a type 0 system, right? Because a system is type 0 if a step input results in an output that converges to a non-zero constant. Okay, so that's the sort of a check of our understanding. Okay, now the next thing, okay, so that's sort of, that's just the, the foundation of this uh, lecture, is, that is the basic definition of the system type. Okay? I'm going to give you another tool that you can use, because for most of this lecture, we're only considering when, things, when time approaches infinity. Okay? We don't really care about the transient behavior like we did in lecture 3 and 4, for example. We only care about steady state behavior when t approaches infinity. Now, if you look at this... Uh, if you look at the form of this response right here, y of t is 1 minus e to the minus 2t, we can see what happens as t approaches infinity by plugging in infinity right, to for the time argument. And e to the minus infinity, that's 0. That just decays, it's exponential decay. So it's very easy to see that the steady state output, sometimes referred as SS, steady state output 
converges to a value of 1, or y of infinity is equal to 1. This is called the steady state output. And ultimately, when we connect this idea of system type to the tracking control objective, we're mostly concerned with steady state error, right? We want to see that as t approaches infinity, our output is going to match our input, right? So it's, it's a nice thing to be able to, instead of having to go through this work of taking the inverse Laplace of some forced response computation, if we could somehow go straight to the steady state response, that would be pretty nice, okay? And we actually have a tool available, which is the next little piece of the puzzle that I'm going to give you. It's called the final value theorem. And it's a nice way, it's a neat little trick to compute the steady state value of any given system without having to do the full inverse Laplace calculation. Okay? So the final value theorem is actually pretty straightforward. It says that the steady state time uh, function or time output is, is equal to the following. This just means is is defined to be. This is a definition here. Okay, so so and there's one little caveat here. Assuming that big Y of S is stable, and that's a big that's a key component. Y of S has to be stable, then little Y of infinity is equal to this limit. Okay, so this is actually a nice little tool that you're going to want to call upon several times as you work through these types of exercises. Um, in the previous example, okay, so we, we basically, we did a, okay, we started with the transfer function here. We said, well, what is a step response going to look like? So I knew that big R of S was 1 over S. And then I had this product of 2 over S plus 1, uh, 2 over S plus 2 times 1 over S. And I had to take the inverse Laplace of that to get my my uh, y of t forced response. Okay, so for this, you know, pretty basic uh, function, it wasn't that tricky. But you know, you have seen in the past where doing an inverse Laplace um, computation could take a while if you have to do partial fraction expansion and find the coefficient. So that could take a long time. Let's see if our final value theorem agrees with what we got here, which was that the steady state value. Uh, was 1. Okay, so the way we would apply it here is to say, okay, uh, the application here is we want little y of infinity, so we need to figure out but bi what big y of s is. Okay, so we, we still have to compute that y of s is equal to g times r, but once you have that, you can plug straight into the final value theorem. Okay, so the final value theorem says that y of infinity is equal to the limit as s goes to 0 of big Y of s, but big Y of s is g times r, which is 2 over s times s plus 2. Okay, So this is big Y of s, which is ultimately just g times r. Now, as a limit, this is pretty easy. You just plug in 0 everywhere you see s, and you, you basically get your response, right? Uh, what I forgot, what I forgot, of course, was that the definition of the final value theorem says that it's s times big Y of s. Okay, so I kind of missed that. That would have been a problem, right? So this here, that's big Y of s equals g, g of s times r of s, and I just plugged in what I had: two over s times s plus two. Now you can see pretty clearly that well, these s's are going to cancel. And when I plug in s equals 0 to the remaining s here, I just get 2 over 2. And 2 over 2 is equal to 1. So basically, almost in a trivial fashion, I was able to confirm, like we did up here, that the steady state output is equal to 1. Okay, so this is an application of the final value theorem. And it's again, it's an easy way to see what the final value of, of the particular system will be as t approaches infinity. Okay, so we're going to need that uh, as we as we sort of step in to the tracking control objective. We're going to want to use the final value theorem as well as the definition of the system type to start making a few connections. Okay, so up until now, you know, the, the definition of system type, the final value theorem, those are general 
definitions and 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 um, and functions, right? Those those are general. Those aren't specific to the tracking control objective. What we're going to do now is we're going to zoom in a little bit. So we're so now everything from this line forward, we're talking specifically about uh, steady state error uh, for the tracking control objective. And the setup for this next portion of the lecture uh, is based on, as, as always, is based on the unity feedback control structure. And we're going to introduce a couple of new terms. Okay, so we're going to introduce a couple of new terms. We're going to define this transfer function h. And h is defined as the transfer function uh, uh, th this ratio here, 1 over 1 plus L of S, where L of S has its own definition. L of S itself is CP, so C times P. And H of S, uh, fundamentally speaking, is a transfer function from R to E. Remember, for tracking, for the tracking control objective, we're concerned about minimizing the error which is the numerator, or the output of this transfer function, given any reference that we're trying to track. So this is the transfer function of interest for when we're talking about tracking. Uh, we're going to assume H is stable for all the downstream discussion, because of course, if we don't have stability, how can you track anything? You can't, right? So we're going to assume H is stable, and so we've introduced two new names for transfer functions, H and L. Um, H is just the open loop transfer function, C times P. I'm sorry, L is just the open, trans, uh, open loop transfer function, C times P, and H is a transfer function from R to E. Okay, so with this setup, uh, what we're going to do is basically we're going to try and connect the the concept of the system type, which we already brought up. We want to connect that concept to the actual tracking control objective. Because if we can do that, uh, it will help us to identify what our controller needs to look like. Right? We, it'll help us to figure out what needs to go in here so that we can track a given type of reference. Okay. All right, so jumping in here, uh, immediately after this setup, I'm going to I'm going to give you another definition. Okay, so so you're starting to see that it, it does seem like this is sort of a, a piecemeal lecture of a bunch of different seemingly random facts, but uh, it's all going to it's all going to come together. So you just have to rely on you just have to trust me for now that all these pieces will eventually fit together. Okay, so we have our definition of the steady state error for tracking control. We've got some new transfer functions defined. Now I'm going to define a couple of new things. And these are called error constants. And error constants don't really have any physical implication. These are just mathematical definitions that are going to help our derivations later on. Okay, so uh, try not to get too caught up in, in the, the meaning behind these. Um, uh, and, and we're just going to use these as mathematical tools, okay? So there's something called the position constant, and the definition of position constant Kp is equal to the limit as s goes to 0 of L of s. And the L of s I'm referring to is this definition up here. It's the open loop transfer function. There's something called the velocity constant Kv, that's defined as the limit as s goes to 0 of s times L of s, sort of one step up. Okay? The acceleration constant is defined as, uh, you, may, you may guess, s squared times L of s. And there is so, such thing as a kth order error constant. And by following the pattern, the only thing that changes is that the power on the S keeps increasing. And again, remember, there's there's no real physical, there, there's nothing to relate, there, there's nothing uh, 
about these error constants that you should try to relate to in real life. And these are just mathematical definitions that will help our derivations later on. Okay. 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 So what are we doing next? What we're trying to do now is to develop some generalized formula for steady state error values uh, as a function of different types of reference inputs. Okay. So let's let's do kind of let's try and tie a couple of things together here. Uh, the the step input. Okay, so remember, we're now we're we're into the world of steady state error for tracking control. So we're going to be using this H definition, L definition, and a bunch of the error constants. Okay, so for a step input applied to the H of S transfer function, what we have is R of T is equal to one, which implies that big R of S, as we know, the Laplace transform of uh, R of T equals one is one over S. What we also know is that if we solve for E in this transfer function as a forced response, we get that E of S is equal to H of S times R of S. Okay, I'm just multiplying both sides of this transfer function definition by R. That's all I'm doing at this point. Okay. Uh, I know what R of S. Uh, I know what R of S is, right? So H of S we're going to keep general, but I know that um, R of S is one over S. So E of S should be equal to one over S times H of S. Based on this E of S, what I want to know is what is the actual steady state error? Okay, so when I'm trying to track a step reference, is there some general formula for computing the steady state error uh, for this particular reference, um, the step reference? Right, that's what I'm trying to compute. And if I know big E of S and I'm trying to figure out little e of infinity, well, this is a good place to apply the final value theorem, right? So the final value theorem, right? right? Ah, so, so we're starting to tie a couple of pieces together. Okay, so by the final value theorem, E of infinity should be equal to, now where is it? The final value theorem should be equal to the limit as S goes to zero of S times, not Y of S, but big E of S. Okay, so the final value theorem, remember, it applies to any variable of interest. So it should be the limit as s goes to zero of s times big E of s, like so. This is just a direct application of the final value theorem. Now, we have an expression for E of s, right? For the step response, it's h of s times r of s, where r of s is 1 over s. So I can make that substitution, like so. I can make that substitution there. Uh, and what I see is that these S's actually cancel. And so the steady state error for a step reference is simply the limit as S goes to zero of H of S. And H of S is defined here. It's one over uh, one plus L of S. Okay, so I'm gonna make that substitution now. Okay, so canceling the S's, it reduces to the following. Uh, H of S, that's 1 over 1 plus L of S, right? Now remember, this is the actual amount of error. This is the actual difference between R and Y you're going to have for any arbitrary transfer function uh, when you're trying to track a step reference. So that's pretty interesting. Now it's a little bit messy, right? I, I don't like seeing the limit as S goes to 0 of 1 over 1 plus L of S, so this is an instance where we can apply our error constants. Okay, so right, if you were to take this limit inside of this argument, the only place where it applies is to this L of S function. Right, the limit of it, as S goes to zero of one is just one. Okay, so bringing the limit inside, we basically have one over one plus the limit as S goes to zero of L of S. Well, the limit as S goes to zero of L of S we gave that a name. It's called the position constant. Okay, so what's nice here is we can apply that definition and say that 
this nice, clean, closed form solution is the actual amount of steady state error you will have when subject to a step reference. That is very nice. This is a very nice thing to have because depending on what your C and your P are, you can plug them in to this L of S, figure out your KP, and now you can see exactly how far off your output will be from your input. Right? You can figure out the steady state error. In fact, what you can deduce from this is if you want to have a steady state error of zero, if you want to track perfectly, based on this equation, actually it implies that your position constant needs to approach infinity. Right? If kp diverges to infinity, that implies you have perfect tracking for a step reference. Okay, so we're going to do this a couple of more times. We're going to do it for the ramp input. But you're going to see a pattern emerge because for the ramp input, R of t is not 1. It's equal to t. And the only thing that changes here is that uh, if, if little r of t is t, big R of s is now 1 over s squared. Right? It's not 1 over s as it was for the step. It's actually now 1 over s squared. But everything else, th this entire process, we're going to repeat. And really, the only thing that comes out of it uh, is the following. So I'll do it for the ramp uh, just to show you. But I'm not going to do it for like the parabolic because the process becomes identical. Okay, so again, E of s is equal to H of s times R of s. But now R of s is 1 over s squared. Okay, so, so given that using the final value theorem, E of infinity, the steady state error when subject to a ramp input, that's going to be the limit as s goes to 0 of s times big E of s. And big E of s is h times r of s. Okay, but r of s is now 1 over s squared. And I'm left with my h of s there. Okay, now in the previous case, both s's canceled. One canceled from the numerator and one canceled from the denominator. In this case, we're actually left with one in the denominator. So, so this s goes away, but we're left with one s in the denominator. Uh, what this amounts to uh, is, is really just the following. Okay, so we'll clean this up. The limit as s goes to zero. We have a one over s floating in there. Uh, 1 over s is floating around in here, and h of s, remember, is 1 over 1 plus l of s, right? So this is h of s here, and this is all of this is still equal to the steady state error. Well, I can absorb this s by um, distributing it into the denominator, and I'm left with the limit as s goes to 0 of 1 over s plus s l of s, okay? And now what we have again is this is the actual amount of steady state error you should expect when applying a ramp reference. Now this looks a little bit messy, right? So if you absorb the limit into the uh, argument, well, the limit as s goes to 0 of s is 0. You just plug in 0 for s, plus the limit as s goes to 0 of s times L of s we don't know what that is, but we have a name for it. Okay, we already made that definition. That's called the velocity constant. So in this case, the actual amount of steady state error you can expect when you apply a ramp reference is equal to 1 over, and now remember this s goes to 0 when you apply the limit, so it's really just 1 over kv, which is the velocity constant as defined above. Okay, so what, remember the goal is to try and connect the idea of system type to um, uh, the, the tracking control objective and, and we're incrementally getting there now because we're developing equations essentially for determining steady state error um, in a general form, which is what we want to be doing. Okay, so for a parabolic, okay, for a parabolic um, input, that has a form of R of t is equal to t squared, and in this case the, in this case the R of s is proportional to one over s cubed. 
Okay, so just like before, I don't want to do this all over again um, because there's only one place where this makes a difference, and that's instead of being left with a 1 over s floating uh, in this argument, now you're going to be left with a 1 over s squared because only one of the s's would have canceled um, in the numerator. So the only thing that changes is that when you bring the limit inside, you're going to have an s squared here as well as an s squared here. The limit as s goes to 0 of s squared, that's still 0. And so ultimately what you end up uh, what, you're in, what you end up with is 1 over the limit as s goes to 0 of s squared times L of s. And again, we defined that to be the acceleration constant, um, Ka. Okay, so without going through this entire you know, computation again, following the same logic, we find that the steady state error, generally speaking, for a parabolic uh, reference is going to be 1 over Ka, where Ka is defined as the limit above. Okay, So this is actually a very good thing. We've, we're now starting to develop um, actual formula for steady state error as a function of different uh, reference uh, signals in a generic form. Okay, We're not specifying what the controller or plant is, we're just saying we're putting them in terms of the position, um, sorry, the error constants, which are defined here. And remember that the error constants are themselves functions of L of s, and hence are functions of this, the controller and the plant for that given uh, system. Okay, so we're keeping everything general so that you can apply these to your own systems um, later down the line. Okay. So that's another piece of the puzzle. What I'll do now is I'll do um, I'll do a totally different thing. Okay, so 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 keep that sort of you know keep this stuff that we just derived. Just sort of keep this marinating to the side, and we're gonna we're gonna go over here and do something a little bit different. We're gonna do sort of some exercises uh, that will hopefully reinforce some of the stuff we've already seen, but also highlight this new piece of information that we haven't seen yet. Okay, so in this example we have an actual H of S transfer function. This is again the transfer function from R to E. And for this problem we have S times S plus 1 over S squared plus S plus 2. It's pretty arbitrary, I just made up this example. Uh, the thing to note here what I want you to focus on is um, the poles and zeros of H of S, uh, specifically the zeros of H of S. Remember, zeros of a transfer function are values of S such that the numerator is equal to zero. So this transfer function has zeros at S equals zero and negative one. Both of these values will make the numerator equal to zero. But there's one of them, you know, one of these zeros is at the origin. Okay, so what we say is that H of S has one zero at the origin. And this is where this problem is going to start because we're going to try to, well, we're going to try to connect the zeros at the origin in H with the actual system type so that we can more easily identify the system type of a particular system. Okay. okay, so what you have to do is you kind of have to check. Um, remember, the definition would be H of S is type, well, it depends, is type 0 if a step reference results in an output error converging to a non-zero constant, or H of S is type 1 if a ramp reference converges in an output error uh, uh, results in an output error converging to a non-zero constant and so forth. Okay, so just applying the basic definition of system type, we kind of need to check. Okay, at least for at least um, for this part of the lecture, we still need to check manually uh, before we derive this this next little bit. Okay, so for a step, we have R of t equals one. What what I want to do is check the steady state error. Okay, remember the error is the output of the transfer function h. So the steady state error by applying the final value theorem is the limit as s goes to zero of s times 
E of S, big E of S, where I know that big E of S is equal to H times R, just as in the previous um, example. Okay. R, big R of S for a step reference is going to be 1 over S. Okay, so E of infinity is going to be the limit as S goes to 0 of S times E of S, which is H times R. Well, R is 1 over S, and H is the given transfer function, S times S plus 1 over S squared plus S plus 2. Okay, evaluating this limit, these S's cancel, but there's still one S left over in the numerator. So if I apply this limit as S goes to 0, I'm going to get a 0 in the numerator and something non-zero in the denominator. So the error is actually going to go to 0, the steady state error. 0 steady state error is actually a good thing. That implies that I'm tracking the step reference perfectly, but the point of this exercise is to try and find a way to determine the system type based on just looking at the transfer function. Okay, And 0, unfortunately, and this is a weird thing to write, a 0 is not a non-zero constant. Right. I understand that that's weird to write, but our definition of system type relies on this notion of the output converging to a non-zero constant. Well, zero is not a non-zero constant. So this is this computation does not allow us to identify the system type for that transfer function. If if we apply a ramp, if we apply a ramp, then in this case R of t is equal to t. And therefore, big R of S equals 1 over S squared. Well, then the computation for <coughs> steady state error looks like this. It's the limit. It's the same computation above. The only thing that changes is big R of S. Okay, so it's the limit as S goes to 0 of, of S times E of S. But E of S, again, is H times R. And R is 1 over S squared in this case. And the H hasn't changed. It's still S times S plus 1 over s squared plus s plus 2. Okay, So this is the steady state error uh, as computed by the final value theorem. And what you see here is there's an s here and an s here. There's two s's in the numerator, two s's in the denominator. Those both cancel. So this limit will actually evaluate. If you plug in 0 for all the other s's, you're still left with the 1 half. And 1 half is a non-zero constant. Okay, so based on this line alone, we can now identify this as a type 1 system. Because remember, the definition for system type is a system is type 1 if a ramp input results in an output. Remember the output for this transfer function, h, is equal to e results in an output that converges to a non-zero constant. In this case, we got one-half, right? So now we can determine that this is a type 1 system. Just for the sake of completeness, let's look at one reference more complicated than the ramp. Right? We've already done the work that we needed to do. We're just sort of doing this for fun. If r of t is equal to t squared, then r of s is equal to 1 over s cubed. Well, then you can see pretty clearly that the steady state error, remember the only thing that changes is big R of S, the steady state error would be S times E of S, which again is R times H, but this time R is 1 over S cubed. And again, H hasn't changed. However, this limit, what you're left with is two of the S's cancel, but there's still one S left in the denominator. So, unfortunately, this uh, limit diverges, right? So this limit diverges, which means that this particular system, if you try to track a parabolic reference, well, your error is going to keep diverging. Okay? So not only can your output measurement not track the reference, it's going to keep getting further and further away from the reference. Okay? So this is an illustration of two things. One is that it's as you increase the complexity of the reference, right? So 
A step reference is pretty simple. It's just t to the 0, right? A ramp reference is a little more complicated. It's t to the 1. Parabolic is a little bit more complicated. It's t squared. As you make the complexity of the reference more uh, higher, right? So as the reference gets more complex, it becomes harder and harder to track that particular reference. Okay, so that's one outcome of this example. The primary outcome of this example is the following. Remember at the very beginning, we identified that h of s has one zero at the origin, right? Remember, it has two zeros total, but one of them is at the origin. Well, we have identified that this is a type 1 system. And it turns out that you can generalize that uh, to the following. You can generalize it based on the number of zeros at the origin in H. So now you don't now you don't have to go through this whole exercise of testing increasingly complex references to identify the system type. Now all you have to do based on this generalization is to say that H of S is type K. Right? H of S is type K. That's that's basically saying the same thing as H of S has that many zeros at the origin. Okay, this is the next little piece of the puzzle, the next little nugget of information that we're going to eventually stitch together. Okay, so now, remember how hard it was to identify the system type. Even way at the beginning of the lecture, we had to sort of look at some input-output relationships, and in this example, we had to check a bunch of increasingly complex references to identify the system type. Well, now we have a tool um, uh, to identify the system type simply by looking at the transfer function h. Okay. Okay. So we look at the transfer function h, look at the zeros, the number of zeros at the origin that is equivalent to the system type. That's very powerful. We're not quite done yet because, you know, what good does this information do if you can't connect it to control design? Okay, so we're zeroing in very slowly uh, on, on how does this all relate to the actual control design aspect of, 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 a, of a given system. Okay, so now we know that h of s is type k. That's the same thing as h of s has k uh, zeros at the origin. Let me give you one other uh, little example here. Let's let's uh, let's try and incorporate L of s. Okay, so L of s remember is c times p. Uh, L of s is c p uh, per our definition above. And L of s for this example, this will just be s plus one over s times s plus two, for example. Now what we're going to do is focus on the poles of L of s. The poles of L of s remember you get by solving the denominator. Okay, so uh, what values of s make the denominator equal to zero? Well, s equals zero and negative two. Those are the poles of L of s. There happens to be one at the origin, so we're going to start by saying L of s has one pole at the origin. That's the starting point for this. Now, based on this L of s, all we're going to do is compute the corresponding h of s. Remember, h of s is defined as 1 over 1 plus L of s. Okay, so we're just going to compute h of s based on this given L of s. And plugging in what we have for L of s, we get uh, the following. 1 over 1 plus the fraction s plus 1 over s times s plus 2. So this is h of s, but what I want to do is I want to visualize h of s as a rational function. So one polynomial divided by another, another polynomial. So I'll have to do a little bit of rearranging, right? So I'll multiply, you know, instead of 1, I'll multiply top and bottom by s times s plus 2, get a common denominator, and cancel some things out. When I do that, the resulting h of s, given this L of s is the following. It's s times s plus 2 divided by s squared plus 3s plus 1. So this is the h of s, right, which remember is a transfer function from r to e corresponding to this given L of s. 
Now look here. The h of s that we just computed here has the same zeros as the poles of L of s. So what we're finding is for this particular arrangement of, um, <coughs> of, um, of C and P uh, regarding L, H of s is defined as 1 over 1 plus L of s. That particular arrangement corresponds to the fact that the the poles of L of s are the same as the zeros of H of s, and that's the key there, okay? So if the poles of L of s are the same as the zeros of H of s, we can also say that H of s has one zero at the origin, right? H of s has one zero at the origin, which we can relate back to this thing that we just derived. So the system type can now be determined by either looking at the zeros at the origin in H or the poles at the origin in L. Okay, so we'll modify the thing that we just derived up there by saying H of S is type K. That's the same thing as uh, L of S has K poles at the origin. This is a very important fact that we just derived. Okay, so the system type of the transfer function H is numerically the same as the number of poles at the origin in L of S. That's, that's the, the big piece of information that we just derived. This is going to come in handy when we do control design because remember L of S L of s is the product of C and P. This is precisely where the control design element is going to come into play because the plant has poles that are fixed by physics. We can't adjust the poles of the plant, but we can adjust the poles of the controller, right? And by placing poles at the origin in the controller, we can increase the number of poles at the origin in L and thereby influence the system type of H. Okay, so the last piece of the puzzle, so this is a really important one, the last piece of the puzzle is to um, summarize a couple of the exercises that we did previously into this big matrix, okay? So we're going to summarize the the previous examples where we looked at the various step, um, the various reference types, step, ramp, and parabolic, uh, and basically uh, combine that with the earlier derivation of those steady state error values in the generic form. Okay, so what you end up with is if we collect all of that information together, what we can do is to make this rather beautiful table where we can basically for any given reference we want to track and for any given system type that we have um, available we can figure out the actual steady state error okay okay so we got the system type on one axis and the type of reference on the other Okay, so a polynomial has a form of t to the k over k factorial, just for, for the sake of completeness of this table. Now, what we have did in the previous um, examples, basically to, to derive the diagonal of this table. Okay, so for a step reference, if the system is type 0, the actual amount of steady state error we should expect is this amount. 1 over 1 plus kp, kp being the position constant defined above. Right, so just keep in mind that this is a table of steady state error values. Right, this is the actual amount of steady state error, e of infinity, as a function of the system type and the type of reference we want to track. 
Okay, so, so what we computed in an earlier exercise is basically this. If you're trying to track a ramp reference and you have a type 1 system, the actual amount of error you will uh, be left with is 1 over 1 plus kV. And if you're trying to track a parabolic reference and you have a type 2 system, you will find that the error is actually equal to 1 over kA. We can generalize this to a type k system and a polynomial input. This is where that sort of kth order uh, error constant comes into play, which just follows along the basic um, pattern of the error constants. Okay. Another thing that we uh, determined in in one of the later examples is that we okay for the for what for that example we were dealing with a type one system, and we were trying to check to see what that system type was. We didn't know it was type one at the time, so we tried to apply a step input and we found that for a type 1 system the steady state error associated with a step reference is zero. In other words we can track a step reference perfectly with zero steady state error if our system is type 1. However if we tried to uh, track a more complicated reference like a parabolic reference we found that we simply could not do it. The error would diverge to infinity and that's true for any subsequent uh, uh, reference that's more complex than the parabolic uh, input as well. Okay, so on this part of the exercise, what we're seeing in this row of the type 1 row, for simple references like the step, we should be able to track them perfectly. And then at some critical point, like the ramp reference, we'll be able to track the reference pretty closely to within a constant value. So we're never going to diverge from that error, but we're never going to converge on the reference exactly. So we're going to have a constant error and the amount of that constant error is given by 1 over kV. And then of course you try to track any other reference like parabolic, your output is simply going to diverge further and further away from that reference which is indicative of this inf uh, infinite steady state error. Well that trend applies to any system type that you have. So for a type 0 system which can track a step reference to this constant value, if the system is type 0 and you try and track a ramp reference, you're not going to be able to. You're going to diverge. And that the same can be said about any subsequently more complicated reference. Okay, so that pattern uh, applies to all the system types. A system type of 2 will be able to track a step reference and a ramp reference perfectly, but if you try to track a parabolic reference, you'll find that you can only do that to within a constant value. Anything more complicated than that, you're going to find that, well, the error diverges. Okay, so we'll complete this table. And this is, remember, an, a table of the actual steady state error values as a function of your system type and your, the, the, um, uh, the nature of your reference. Okay, so this is one of the biggest takeaways from this lecture, and it will help you do control design. And the way that it's going to help you control, do control design is by this, this secondary piece of information, which I mentioned is super important. Okay? If we were to look at this table, okay, you look at this table that we just constructed based on the, the outcome of this lecture, let's suppose I want to be able to track a step reference perfectly. This is often the case when you're doing control design. Pretty much any common control system you can think of, you want to be able to track a step reference with zero steady state error perfectly, right? This is the case, right? So we'll go back to the cruise control example. If you set the reference speed to 65, you want your output speed to be 65 so that your error is zero, right? It wouldn't do you much good if you set the reference to 65, but your your cruise control system took you to 75 and held you there, right? That's a constant error, but that's no good. We need zero steady state error. So what could you say about the minimum system type required to be able to track a step reference perfectly? Well, you would say that, well, step type 0, that's not going to cut it. If I want perfect tracking, I need a minimum uh, system type of 1. Okay, I need a minimum system type of 1. Now, if my plant does not have any poles at the origin, what can I do about the controller to bump up the system type from 0 to 1. This is the key concept that uh, is going to connect 
all of this conceptual stuff about system type back to the control uh, objective of, of tracking. Okay, remember that H of S. Okay, so this is type. This is a type. The system type of H of S. Okay, so if I want the system to be type one, then L of S needs to have at, at, needs to have one pole at the origin. If my plant P of S does not have any poles at the origin, I can insert a pole at the origin in L of S by by careful design of C of S. I can I can implement a pole at the origin in C of S, which will subsequently put a pole at the origin in L of S, which will subsequently bump up the system type of H of S to one, and therefore I should be able to track a step reference perfectly. This is the control design aspect of, of this of this topic here. Okay, so a controller with a pole at the origin looks like this. Right? This is a controller. It has one pole and that pole is at the origin. So one over K over S, that's a controller with one pole at the origin. And that will serve to bump up the system type and potentially um, help track more complicated references. Okay? All right, so I understand that this uh, entire lecture was very piecemeal, but the two biggest takeaways were, uh, one, this table of actual steady-state error values as functions of system type and uh, reference, as well as, oops, as well as this other fact that we derived, which has to do with the system type of H as it pertains to the number of poles at the origin in L. Okay, so these are the two biggest takeaways from this lecture. Now, with those two pieces of information, we can actually do some control design. Okay, let's take an example that looks like this. So you have a pretty simple plant and a very simple proportional gain controller. Right? Remember, this controller is just uh, this is just a, a number. Right? It's one, two, three, four, five. It's just a gain value. Okay, with this. Uh, controller in this plant in the unity feedback control structure we might ask the question of well when we close the loop will we be able to track a step reference perfectly in other words can we achieve zero steady state error given r of t equals one graphically that means with r of t is equal to one can my output can my y of t converge on that value? Can I get can I get zero steady state error uh, e equals zero? Right? Can I achieve that? Um, I don't know. Can we? Uh, a couple of ways you can approach this. You could you could compute the closed loop transfer function cp over one plus cp which is the transfer function from R to Y. And then you could apply little r of t is equal to 1 for this step. You could go through all the steps and inverse Laplace operations to compute little y of t and see if y of infinity, in fact, equals 1 to verify that you can track perfectly. But that seems like a lot of work, and it is a lot of work. Okay, So rather than do that, why don't we just identify the system type of h and see if we're able to track a step reference. Okay, what I mean is, well, I've got my C and I've got my P here. Okay, so let's start by computing L of S, which is CP. C times P, that's just K over S plus one when I plug in my given values. L of S has, well, it has one pole, but that pole is not at the origin, right? The pole of L of S is at negative one. So so L of S has zero poles at the origin, right? What that implies is that H of S is type zero. Easy, right? H of S is type zero. So the question is, can this closed loop system track a step reference perfectly? Well, the answer is no, because if you look back at our chart, I'm dealing with a type zero system, if I try to track a step reference, I will, I will be able to do it sort of, but not perfectly, right? This is the amount of steady state error that I'm going to get, 
right? So not only do I know that I can't track the step reference perfectly, I actually know how far off I will be uh, because it's equal to 1 over 1 plus kp, right? So the answer is no, this, this will not, not be the case for that particular controller, right? Uh, in fact, I, I can actually compute how much error I'm going to see, right? Because steady state error for a step reference is given by 1 over 1 plus uh, 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 kp, right? 1 over 1 plus the position constant. The position constant is, again, just that mathematical shortcut. It's just the limit as s goes to 0 of L of s, where L of s is c times b. So I'm just looking at the limit as s goes to 0 of k over s plus 1. This limit uh, reduces to just k, right? It's, it's just, right, so this s goes to 0, and I've got k over 1, so kp is equal to the actual gain control value k. So not only am I not going to be able to track a step reference, I know that my steady state error is going to be 1 over 1 plus k, which is the actual gain that I'm using in that controller. And that's it. That's all the work that we have to do for the tracking control objective on this particular system. Now, if, if you're not comfortable stopping there, right, so the question was, well, I have this plant, and I want to track a step reference perfectly, will this controller work? The answer was no, we are not able to track uh, that step reference perfectly. Where do we go from there? How do we improve this control design so that we can track a step reference perfectly? Well, you you might refer back to this chart and say, well, okay, I had a type 0 system. If I want to be able to track a step reference perfectly with zero steady state error, then at minimum I need a type 1 system. Right? This is the proper logic to take when you're doing control design for tracking. Right? At minimum I need a type 1 system. Now my plant, my plant has no poles at the origin, but my controller is up for debate. I can make my controller whatever I want it to be. So I want to have a type 1 system. Remember that uh, the, the, the system type of H is equivalent numerically to the number of poles at the origin in L. So what I could potentially do as an update to this control scheme is to, okay, so C of S equals K. That didn't work out, right? That gave me a type 0 system. What I might rather try is C of S equals K over S. It seems arbitrary, but maybe after you study the, uh, the the concepts in this lecture, this will become an obvious choice, right? That's that's my hope, right? If C of S is K over S, what that means is that L of S now becomes K over S times S plus 1. Remember, L of S is C times P. This is one pole at the origin. So L of S now has one pole at the origin, now, this implies that H of S is type 1. So I've bumped up the system type from 0 to 1. And if H of S is type 1, I should be able to track a step reference perfectly, right? right? So based on the fact that I see that S in the denominator of the L of S transfer function, I can immediately conclude that the steady state error, uh, steady state error, for a step reference is zero, and I get perfect tracking. That's really all you have to do as far as control design. But you would not have known to make this uh, change to the controller if you hadn't gone through this discussion of the system type and steady state error. Now, it seems like a little bit cavalier to just say, oh, I'm going to put a pole at the origin. I know based, based on the table, I'll, I'll be tracking perfectly, so that's it. Um, you may want to verify just analytically beforehand just to, to make sure that this control design scheme will work. Um, I'm sure it will, but, but, but you need to convince yourselves that this controller will actually work. Okay, so one way to do that, and this is the last thing that I'll do, 
One way to do that, to verify that you're actually going to track perfectly, is to, in fact, look at the closed loop transfer function from R to Y. Closed loop transfer function from R to Y, as we know, is CP over 1 plus CP, based on our review of block diagram algebra in lecture 6. And if I were to plug in my controller in plant, where, remember, C is equal to 1 over S, or K over S, if I made those substitutions, I end up with I end up with yeah I end up with the G of S that looks like this K over S squared plus S plus K it's second order now which is fine there's nothing wrong with that and this is my actual closed loop transfer function again from R to Y and if I make R of T equal to a unit step input I know that big R of S is 1 over S. Okay, so I know now that big Y of S, which equals G times R, looks like K over S squared plus S plus K times big R of S, which is 1 over S. Now, just as we did in lecture 2, if I want to know little y of t, I need to take the inverse Laplace of this big thing. Now that's kind of messy, so I'll, you know, it's in the notes, I've done it in the notes, and it's really like, there's a lot of work involved, as you as you may recall from from earlier lectures, but you can still you can still power your way through the algebra and actually take this inverse Laplace, and you will find that it has, after doing some partial fraction expansion and computing of the coefficients, it has the following form. And this is really just more an illustration to show you what you can avoid if you use this new method of of analyzing the system based on system type um, and, and doing steady state error analysis this way. Right, so you end up with this pretty awful looking uh, thing, right? You, pretty awful looking analytical response. Uh, like, like so. I, I believe this should be square root, yeah. Okay, so this is your actual analytical step response for when we apply the updated controller, uh, C of S equals K over S, to the original uh, plant. And, you know, it's one thing to just write this down. The important thing is to identify what does this look like. Okay, what does this actually look like? Remember, I am trying to track a reference of one. I'm trying to track a unit step reference, right? Now this is the actual closed loop response that I get when I implement a controller that looks like this. What you should identify is that this is basically the sum of three terms. It's a constant value minus a decaying exponential times a sinusoidal function minus another decaying exponential times another sinusoidal function. So these are those traditional sort of oscillations that eventually decay, and there's two of them, but the point is, as as t approaches infinity, all that stuff decays to zero, and you're really only left with this uh, steady state value. So we know that our output is going to look something like this, right? This is all those decaying exponential oscillations, but eventually our output is going to converge on a value of one, and by that very image we can see visually that my steady state error does indeed approach zero so I am tracking perfectly all right this is what we just derived in basically a couple of lines of of analysis right we said well I, I need L of s to have a pole at the origin so I'll just put one there now I've got a type 1 system so I should be able to track a step reference perfectly okay all we did in this uh, stuff down here is to verify that using an old-fashioned an old method, and what we find is that um, we do indeed see that it works. We get zero steady-state error. We get perfect tracking. Okay, okay so I'm going to wrap things up here. Um, the next thing we're going to do is, so so we've, we've basically addressed stability control objective and tracking control objective. 
Um, there were two more control objectives, ones pertaining to the robustness of the system, i.e. regulation, and then one has to do with the, the, uh, the cost associated with uh, designing these controllers. I'm not going to do dedicated lectures for those control objectives. Rather, what we're going to do next is jump into a particular um, form of a controller. It's called the PID controller. Uh, it's one of the most popular controllers used in practice, and we're going to study the in, ins and outs of that control scheme before getting into more uh, control design methods. Um, and the reason I bring that up is that this form of a controller, where you have a denominator with just S, so you have a pole at the origin in the controller, uh, this is referred to as integral control. Wow. Well, and this is one of the three um, parts of the PID control. So the PID stands for Proportional Integral Derivative Control. This is the uh, part of the controller, this is a part of the PID controller that addresses steady state behavior. And now having looked at this um, concept of system type and steady state error, it should start to make sense why putting an S in the denominator of the controller will improve your steady state response as far as tracking because well that's what this whole lecture was about is identifying system type and seeing what types of references the system can or can't track okay so we'll wrap things up here and um, we're gonna jump into the PID control really the, the most widely used control scheme I think in my opinion um, in practice and we're gonna we're gonna study that next time okay so we'll see you in the next one